This way. I want anybody at this corner at all, period, okay? I'd like to see everybody that way, okay? People understand? I want you that way, please. Very much. Thank you. Go home. The story of Biggie and Tupac is the story of two great friends who had a misunderstanding, a falling out, and became deadly enemies. Their murders were explained as being the result of the rivalry that had grown up between them. This is Biggie. Biggie and Tupac always used to hang out together. Biggie's last album sold over 10 million copies. This is Tupac. He made $80 million in sales in just one year. It was the occasion of Puffy's birthday in 1994. And if you look really closely, you'll see the rarest of footage of Biggie and Tupac hugging on the edge of stage. Biggie and Tupac were street buddies. Biggie called Tupac Duke. Tupac called Biggie Christopher. Biggie used to open for Tupac. But the friendship changed. There were accusations of treachery and betrayal. Tupac accused Biggie of trying to have him killed. Tupac claimed to be having an affair with Biggie's wife. Their murders were explained as being the result of a feud that had grown up between them. But it was this explanation that got us interested. Tonight's shocking allegations against the city's top cop. Former detective Russell Poole has filed suit against the department. Poole says he uncovered dirty cops while investigating the murders of rappers Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur. I provided the chief with enough uh, information and evidence that would warrant a full uh, probe. And at that meeting, I was ordered not to uh, investigate any further. Los Angeles, California. We're driving to meet ex-detective Russell Poole at his lawyer's office. Ex-detective Poole resigned after 18 years on the force when he was prevented from investigating fellow police officers whom he believed to be involved in the murders of Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur. Russell Poole is currently suing the Los Angeles Police Department. This is the office of ex-detective Russell Poole. Hi, thank you, thank you. We'd been having a real struggle with Russell's lawyers. They were refusing to allow us to interview him, despite endless lunches and happy hour cocktails. Russell could talk about the case all day, but this is all they'd allow him to say. On the advice of my attorney, due to ongoing litigation, I cannot make a, a, a statement to you. So I hope we, we will return for a longer statement on the whole Biggie Smalls killing and Tupac scandal. Cut! Okay. <laughs> Cut? Is that it? <laughs> I had no idea at this stage how many more meals at Denny's we'd have to eat before we finally got Russell's interview. In the meantime, we went back to the East Coast where both Biggie and Tupac were born and grew up. We traveled to Baltimore. Tupac lived here for what he called his happiest and most settled years. Tupac's life was complicated. His mother an ex-Black Panther, no visible father, constantly moving from place to place. It was here in Baltimore that Tupac got his training in the performance arts. Tupac loved acting. Here he is in a wig, impersonating Rick James. Whether I'm bald-headed, 
Oh, I got hair to my knees. I still rush any one of you tricks out there. It's still West Side Outlaw, no matter. This is Michael, one of Tupac's friends. Hi. We'd okay. heard film crews weren't too popular, so we were a little nervous. How you doing? Mate. Michelle, Hi. you remember? <laughs> so this is this was Tupac's house here? Yeah, no. That one there? First floor apartment. First floor apartment? Yeah. Uh, that's where he come from. Michael was trying to sell us some of Tupac's earlier unheard music, probably now worth several million dollars. Here he is talking to Dana, who co-owned the music. Oh, Hello. What's going on here? Just doing some filming. OK, well, don't put that in my face. Well, you were asking me questions. Afini, Tupac's mum, tightly controls his music and has refused to license yeah, it to us. No so we were interested to see what Michael had. So the police are always everywhere around here. Oh, yeah. Yep. It's a bad neighborhood. It's a bad neighborhood? Yep. <laughs> what, what is this exactly? Uh, some music we had for a while, Tupac, and um, a few of us that we did years ago. I'm having a bit of a problem with the helicopter. Oh, yeah. Do you think we should, um, can I just, do you think we could just make a copy or something? Because I'm getting a terrible noise. You can really make no cap. No question to it, yeah. You can listen to it, though. Yeah. It depends. Can't really get at it for free. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How much, how much do you think you would want for it? I really couldn't put no price on that, but... Dude, what happened there? I don't know, something wrong with And that, unfortunately, was the closest we ever got to Tupac's music. This is the school where Tupac trained as an actor. Hi. 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 Welcome Hi. to the Baltimore School of the Arts. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tupac received a formal training here in acting, music, and poetry. We're going to see Tupac's favorite teacher, Donald Hicken, who Tupac said he had adopted as a surrogate father. He was just on all the time uh, and uh, with an incredibly contagious personality. I think people were just drawn to him right away. He had charisma that was astounding. I think people just wanted him to like them and wanted to be his friend and wanted to be wanted to hang with him and wanted to be around him. He just had that kind of magnetism that he came in with. We didn't that was nothing we gave him. He that was all factory equipment with him. Well the smile you should... the smile I said, yeah. He had a fantastic smile, lit up his whole face, had beautiful eyes, and when he fastened them on you, whatever was in those eyes, you that was where you went. Donald said Tupac easily had the range to do Shakespeare. Here he is doing one of his favorite characters, Scarface. You, Mr. Cameron, you say hello to my big friend. <laughs> One Corleo, okay? I will break your fucking balls all over this fucking job. Don't fucking play me, okay, man? <laughs> What's so funny, right? Huh? What's your name? Huh? What's your name, man? Cameraman, dude. Cameraman? That's right. You want to talk? Huh? You want to work for me? Yeah, man. Huh? Okay, you come down tomorrow and talk to me. That's you got a job, man. You got a job, man. Sure, man. Anyway, back. For a long time, Tupac didn't know who his father was. He complained this made him feel unmanly. At first, Tupac's mom, Afini, said she didn't know who his father was. Then she told him his father was dead. Hi, this is Tupac's here? biological hey, father, you? Billy Garland. This is a picture of Billy and his wife, seen here with Tupac and his wife. I asked Billy when he'd lost touch with Tupac. Uh, 76, 77. How old was he then? He was about six, 
spot. He was born in 71. And then he went off what, to California? Went to Baltimore. He went to California. He moved around New York several times. And so... um, Why did they move so often? Well, she uh, was... uh, on crack. She was on. She was on drugs. She did drugs at the time. And uh, one time he was living in shelters, so Pac really had a bad life. So how long was Afini on crack? Oh, I don't know. For a long time, but to the point where uh, Tupac had left the house, and he would tell me some stories that I don't really want to get into. Uh, that occurred around his house. That things happened. But he wasn't like the favorite son that everyone's pretending that he is now. Matter of fact, he told me some stuff that made me laugh that they would make fun of him because he was somewhat of a handsome guy. And everybody else was kind of, um, let's say, dark skinned. And he was somewhat brown and light skinned, and they would call him ugly. And he told me that. And he also said that that only lasted until he became a star, and then he became the favorite son. This is a picture of Tupac and Afini taken on Mother's Day. Whatever problems there might have been, Tupac was very loyal to her. Billy himself re-established relations with Tupac in 1994 after he heard over the radio about Tupac being shot. This shooting was not fatal. It happened two years before he was killed in Las Vegas, and it was for this attack that Tupac blamed Biggie. He was shot in various spots all over his body, growing uh, arm. But they had said that he had his uh, testicles shot up. And the first time I went to visit him after that, he made it a point to show me that he did not have his testicles uh, shot off, and then he went like that, and of course, I knew he was my son. <laughs> oh, really? You want to I don't want to, no, 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 I don't want to touch on that. <laughs> did you say that Big E visited him at the hospital when you were? Uh... Yes, he did. And he introduced himself to me. I thought it was quite nice. He didn't seem like he had anything to do with what had just happened. Um, I didn't think anything of it at the time. But he just approached me and said that he was Biggie, and uh, I hear you're Tupac's father, and anything I could do to help in the situation, please let me know. Ex-detective Paul called up. He's convinced that LAPD officers were involved in Biggie's murder. You know, had it been just your ordinary drive-by shooting by some unexperienced uh, gangbangers, we would have solved it a long time ago. You gotta think to yourself, well, who could do this and get away with it? Cops. If there are cops on our force that are willing to do stuff like this, you have to look at them. You really do. Biggie grew up in this street, St. James's Place in Brooklyn. He lived here in this house until he left home age 20. His real name was Christopher Wallace. Biggie had a very close relationship to his mother. You know, being in the streets or whatever, I done been through so much. My mom's done been through so much. It feel good to just have her at ease. You know what I'm saying? Knowing her son is cool and he ain't in the streets doing no wrong. He trying to make it happen. I got to stay on a positive vibe. All my people's got to stay on a positive vibe, you know? The negativity just brings failure, you know? And we ain't trying to fail in this game. We trying to succeed. Biggie was loved in the neighborhood. His funeral was a massive event. When someone put on Hypnotize, the whole place erupted. The question is, was there another darker side to Biggie? He had the reputation as a tough drug dealer. He used to operate from outside this barber shop. Excuse me. We were just doing a film in the area, and uh, we were wondering if he knew Biggie Smalls at all. (laughs) Yeah. What about you? I know him, but I don't want to be on TV. Thank you. Oh. He the bomb, though. He the bomb. Sorry? I said, like, he the bomb, though. He the bomb. Well, he was the bomb. And it was just across the street from the barber shop at the Met Food Market that a younger Biggie had packed bags. 
This is Biggie's good friend, Ibrahim, who grew up with Biggie and now manages the Met. So, and so he, you would, you would have, what, he used to work in, in this store? Uh, he was packing bags. Yeah, packing bags. Was he a good He was a bag good brother. Packer. He was a good kid. He was a good kid, you know? He wasn't a bully and all like this. Uh, he used to come here and pack bags and make a few dollars. And, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I was a kid too back then, you know? But, <laughs> but he said all that stuff about, you know, selling crack and... Oh, no, no, no. This is, this is just, just business. You know, you know how people that they, they have to say that just to sell the albums and, and stuff killing like people. No. He didn't kill? He was a sweetheart, man. <laughs> Never did nothing like this, uh-huh. No, not Biggie. Not Christopher, uh-huh. <laughs> And it was just round the corner Biggie first started rapping. Biggie went to private school. He was the apple of his mother's eye. Biggie was the one on the street with all the Nintendo games. He was protected from the rougher side of the neighborhood, but became fascinated by it. Chico used to pay Biggie a quarter ago to use his Atari. Later, he became part of Junior Mafia. That's Chico at the back. Biggie's first album had just gone platinum. Have a seat, Let me do this presentation. Puff is on the microphone. Can anybody here make some noise for B.I.T. for bringing it back to the East? Chico and Biggie were like brothers. See, to me, he used to, like, write rhymes. But to me, I always consider as it was, like, a joking thing. It was funny because he never wrote a song. He always wrote a, 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 a story about, well, OK, my next door neighbor, my homeboy, I don't like him no more. He'll write something like that. Like, yo, I took your sneakers and threw them in the garbage, and you ugly, you know, you need a haircut. You know, it, it, that's how he was. It was jokey. It was funny. So when he used to do it all the time, I used to be like, ah, oh, it's joke. But to people that don't be around him, never knew that he can do it out of all this time, you know, because he used to just be eating, what's up? We went to see Biggie's mum, who lives on this private estate. Biggie lived in this house. This is Valletta, Biggie's mum. She was a school teacher, and she appeared in Biggie's first video, Juicy. Valletta had received complaints that I'd barged into the barber shop and disrupted the market. She insisted that I adopt a more ingratiating style. My son is a poet, was a poet. He was a writer. And my son, he would be the first to tell you, I write what I see, and I write and rap about what I hear. People's experience, some of them my experience. Um, was it filth? Yes, it was filth. Some of it was filth. But it was a filthy story, a story that was out there, a story that he wanted to be told. I mean, how would you describe your son as a person? Oh, he was somebody at times you want to kill, you want to strangle. But I'm his mother. You know, he was a very generous person. He was um, ungentle at times, very loving, very sincere, and sincere to his word, to his friends. And my whole crew is lounging, celebrating every day, no more public housing. Thinking back on my one room shack, now my mom pips a act with me on the back. And she loves to show me off, of course, smiles every time my face is up in the source. We used to fuss when the landlord dissed us, no heat, wonder why Christmas missed us. Birthdays was the worst days. Now we sip champagne when we thirsty. Uh, damn right, I like the life I live. Cause I went from negative to positive, and it's all. 
I asked Valletta whether it was true when Biggie sang about his one-room shack and no food on the table. Ah, oh, well, to me, that's a part of an alter ego. That's the rags to riches person that he wants to sing about. In all my son's life, my son left my home when he was 20, and there was not one single second when I didn't have food on my table. I have a seven and a half room apartment. Um, I heard I was, I, I live in a shack. Oh, you said it was a shack? Yeah, my son said it was a, his one room shack. I asked Valletta about Biggie and Tupac's friendship. She blamed its breakup on a dispute between Suge Knight at Death Row Records and Puffy Coombs at Bad Boy Records. All it was is a Puffy and Suge Knight war. Suge Knight, for some reason, had a friend or a cousin or a nephew, got shot down in, in Atlanta, Georgia. He blamed Puffy and hell break loose. So if that's the case, Puffy, Suge Knight, solve your damn problem. They should have done that. So that's where the East Coast, West Coast thing came. Everybody wants to be famous, so they went to the newspaper and gave their own little stories, and everybody start East Coast, West Coast. East Coast was Puffy, West Coast was Suge Knight, East Coast was Biggie, West Coast was Tupac. Come on now, you're messing with lives here. And that's exactly what happened. Two lives were lost as a result of what? Stupidity? The dispute between Suge Knight and Puffy started at the August 95 Source Awards when Suge Knight publicly insulted Puffy and appealed for Biggie to leave Bad Boy and join him at Death Row Records. Any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star, don't want to, don't want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all on the record, dancing, come to Death Row. Biggie didn't accept the invitation. Straight up Brooklyn in the house, representing. It became East Coast versus West. Even Snoop Dogg got dragged into the dispute. The East Coast don't love Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. The East Coast ain't got no love for Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Death Row. Y'all don't love us. Y'all don't love us. Well, let it be known then. We know y'all East Coast. We know where we at. I don't think executive producer that a comment was made about a little bit earlier. But con check this out. Contrary to what other people may feel, I would like to say that I'm very proud of Dr. Dre, of Death Row, and Shook Knight for their accomplishments. You know what I'm saying? I'm a positive black man, and I make music to bring us together, not to separate us. And all this East and West that needs to stop. The Tupac Biggie dispute really got going after Tupac joined Suge Knight at Death Row Records. In a bizarre way, Tupac had found the father figure protector he'd always wanted. He called Suge Knight the Godfather, and together they would endlessly watch the movie The Untouchables. It was like they were all playing parts in a movie. They called Death Row the Untouchable Death Row. Tupac called himself the Don. He loved playing the part of gangster. Two months after joining Death Row, he and Suge Knight assaulted and beat Mark Bell and Associate of Puffy's. Tupac would whisper into Suge Knight's ear, encouraging him to get Puffy's home address, while Suge Knight peed into a glass and forced Mark Bell to drink his urine. Suge Knight inflamed Tupac's dispute with Biggie. Tupac, who worked constantly, became increasingly isolated. He recorded 67 tracks in 11 months. A lot more shit. We only got two weeks to do this whole album. Complete it, mix it down and everything. We don't have time or the luxury to spend all of this time doing one song. We don't have it. We got to somehow find a way that we could double up on it. Because I did my whole album. I know it ain't all of that, but I did my whole album like three songs a day. Because I was just laying it, rocking it, then getting off. You can mix it later and have niggas that love being in the studio all night, just adding a drum beat at a time and shit. You can do that after the rappers leave and shit. <laughs> niggas that love being in the studio and just love listening for the right kick. But for while we in here and you got every, you got like eight rappers here and everybody drinking and smoking and shit, man, get that beat popping. Throw them niggas on the track. You catch everybody freestyling, throw them niggas on the track. 
boom, that's the, the name of the song is whatever this nigga said his word, last word was. We do it, put it down. Then after we finish, we walk out, everybody be here and listen to it. Be like, this the hook, we go in there and lay the hook. If we don't like that hook, the nigga lay another hook, yeah. come back out here, you know, waste scratches or whatever. That be the song. Visible State Police, Princeton Junction. We're on our way to visit Tupac's stepbrother, Mo Prem, who toured with Tupac after Tupac left prison on rape charges. We were told Mo Prem was humiliated and locked on a hotel balcony in the snow when he got into an argument with Suge Knight over payment. This is Mo Prem on the left. He's just finished his first solo album. And that's Mo Prem to the right of Tupac. Mo Prem took the pics. Tupac wrote the comments. Mo Prem adored Tupac. Suge Knight effectively separated them. I guess the reason I wanted to talk to you is because of the way it was between you and Pac and what Death Row did to your relationship. You know, we I heard that that it was you know they had humili it was humiliating. What was humiliating? That you know that you were put through things by Death Row which were humiliating. Mm. Well, mm. the only humiliating thing was being broke. Mm -hmm. Considering what Pac was going through, he had, uh, on top of getting out of jail, there was new problems. Uh, so the plan... Unfortunately, we ran out of sound. I sensed the interview wasn't going too well. Ask you a question and then throw in a sound bite and have you say something to say. I'll sue the fuck out of their ass. I'll break, you can go and break the bank on their ass. Like you just said, like I just told you. You dealt with death row. You know what I'm saying? I mean, with Pac, you didn't deal with death row. Sometimes you were humiliated by death row. I said you were made you annoyed. I'm sorry. Listen. It's I'm not here. I'm... <laughs> Peace in the Middle East. Peace in the Middle East. Yeah, all right. Okay, I'll put it like this. I dealt with Pac. Pac dealt with death row. But you want to hear about the humiliation. It was humiliation. Sometimes I felt bad. Sometimes I felt good. You know, we're from the street. You know, there's all... That, that go down every day in the street. You know? Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But I mean, and I'm... I'm I'm not going to, I'm going to listen to this closely. Right. To judge a character of a man, judge how he comes back from hardship. Check me out. Check me out now. Roll it. This song is written for Mo Prem's family in Tupac. Mo Prem's father, Matulu, Tupac's stepfather, is a Black Panther serving 60 years in prison. Creep back in town, up on everybody real slow. They ran me out about five years ago. I was a little bit harder, a little bit smarter. Just like my father. Hmm. Auntie Yasada, family of riders. Well known to Interpol, principal, don't spit is political. Most critical of go getters, bang with us, slang with us, got you chopping up the game with us. Khomeini still raw on the outskirts of the law. Kicking in your door with the long fall fall. Motherfuckers ain't guilty, they would've just scared for all that shit you said. That you thought that we would stand for, shit, eyes and fled. Left my dog for dead. Riches and name squandered, and now you niggas gonna pay for it. And y'all know it. And the greatest rapper that to ever touch the mic. Tatted on his belly, the words of thug life. It's the return of the outlaw, hands in the air. All my people's getting money, Radio. and you just don't care. For the hustlers, the drugs, honey, thugs. Most cops ain't shit, and they can suck my dick. It's the return of the outlaw, hands in the air. Everyone said there were two sides to Tupac. The wonderful drugs. side, and the not so wonderful. Suge Knight's influence brought out the worst. Tupac now started to wage a war against Biggie. That's Mo Prem and White trying to control Tupac. Tupac was losing control. That's my new staff. Hey, have a good summer. <laughs> have a good summer, Biatch! Tupac became obsessed with the idea 
that Biggie had tried to kill him. While I'm in jail, strangers is telling me, yo, you don't know? Biggie homeboy shot you. Because they bragging. They telling they n****s in jail. Yo, we just got pop. Woo, 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 woo. And that's why what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. I'm destroying them. I'm destroying them. Biggie remained cool. I was more in a mind frame of, keep your mouth shut, big. You know what I'm saying? Just don't feed into it. If you feed into it, it's going to do nothing but escalate. You know what I'm saying? I knew it wasn't true. Well, at least what I knew I was getting blamed for wasn't true. I can't speak for nothing else. You know, I wasn't there. But I know what he was blaming me for wasn't true. So it don't make no sense me sitting there trying to make records or hit magazines and TVs screaming how it ain't true. You know what I'm saying? If it ain't true, I just got to ig it. Another theory about the Tupac Biggie war is that the strangers Tupac referred to in jail, telling him Biggie's homeboys had shot him, were in fact working for the FBI, who had a policy to cause dissension within the hip-hop movement. The FBI were worried by the subversive qualities of hip-hop. They saw a definite connection with the Black Panthers. In fact, hip-hop first started around the same time as the Black Panthers. The Watts Prophets, the first hip-hop artists, developed as a political reaction to the Watts riots. Tupac's mother, Afini, seen here, was a Black Panther, and so were many friends and family members. Dan Quayle, the vice president, criticized Time Warner for releasing Tupac's records, as well as Ice-T's cop killer. I might just say one other thing that is in the category of family values, and, and that is this latest rap record, Cop Killer. Now here you have a responsible corporation, Time Warner, putting out and distributing a record and making money off a record that says it's okay to kill cops. I find that outrageous. The lyrics are outrageous. The lyrics like, die, 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 pig, die. And yet you have a corporation that defends putting out this record because it is constitutional. It looked like Biggie's and Tupac's friendship was used and destroyed by others. Dan Quayle's outburst caused Time Warner to dump Interscope, its subsidiary that released Tupac, who in turn offloaded Tupac, the troublemaker, to Shug Knight at death row. But we had some good news. Ex-detective Paul's lawyer, Leo, has finally agreed to let us interview him. This is Leo's office. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I think you're expected. Are we? You're half an hour early. I know. I just thought we could at least get ready in, because I know that he's in a bit of a rush. Actually, no, you can't, because I'm not ready. Oh, you're not ready. school's not here, and hopefully Leo will be here by 1. Okay. So, well, we'll just wait. Yeah, we're just on a tight schedule all right. today. That's so. all right. Out of desperation, meals at Denny's have become $1,000 dinner tickets for Leo's Senate campaign. It looked like it was all going to work out fine. We saw Russell Poole go in, but then nothing happened. It seemed that Leo had changed his mind again. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Okay. I've got that news for you. Oh. And, and uh, I'm going to apologize profusely, but Leo just called. I've been expecting him to be back. Now, could you please stop rolling, because this has nothing to do right. with the okay. interview. Oh. Russell Poole agreed to meet us anyway. The case is the most important thing in Russell's life. Russell believes that the whole thing started because Suge Knight owed Tupac millions of dollars in royalties. Tupac was about to leave death row and audit them, and that was why he was murdered. <laughs> well, there's Elvis. Russell now follows developments with a case on his computer. Is he one of your favorites? Yeah, I, I do like Elvis. Russell was an apple pie, all-American kind of cop. 
His father, an ex-Marine and ex-Sheriff, was his hero and role model. Russell is one of those cops who says he bleeds blue. He's an old school type of cop. So it's great we were able to do this finally. Yeah, well, don't tell Leo. Uh, <laughs> would you get that on? <laughs> Leo would be pissed. And do you think that there was a connection between the Tupac Shakur killing and the Biggie Smalls killing? Well, that's uh, basically what it appears to be. Uh, a retaliation, okay, and I think Suge Knight wanted it to uh, to look that way, okay, but, uh, you know, had we been able to aggressively investigate and uh, had the heart to uh, connect the two and uh, and do a thorough investigation, I think we probably would have found out more information. And why didn't you? Well, you know, there's a lot of factors, but uh, I think the fact that law enforcement officers were working for death row, and that was a scandal in itself, okay? Uh, the fact that law enforcement officers were working for gangsters, known felons, uh, uh, basically organized crime because it, it was no secret that Death Row Records uh, was involved in drug trafficking. Between 30 and 40 police officers, some of whom are seen here, worked off duty for Death Row. Suge Knight had a lot of power, even within the DA's office. Suge Knight, to me, was one of the most powerful gangsters around. He was well organized, he had a lot of power, and uh, what gave him the power is he had dozens and dozens of police officers working in his organization, okay? He also uh, had a DA that was uh, uh, working on his uh, Who's that? matters. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Larry Longo. Russell believes that Tupac's murder was organized by Suge Knight to look like a gang killing between the Crips and the Pyrus, also known as the Bloods. It was the night of the Tyson fight at the MGM in Las Vegas. Here he is being congratulated by Tupac and Suge Knight. Prior to the fight, Tupac was walking across the casino when one of Suge Knight's Pyru homies whispered into Tupac's ear that a crip was standing nearby. This crip, Orlando Anderson, was supposed to have stolen a death row medallion. Tupac, keen to impress, rushed over and punched Orlando Anderson knocking him to the ground. Suge Knight joined in with the kicking. It was for this kicking, a parole violation, that Suge Knight would receive nine years in prison. Two hours later, Tupac would be mortally wounded fighting for his life. Russell thinks Suge Knight staged the whole casino incident. He thought he would be able to beat this casino probation thing. He really did. It just backfired on him. There's no, nothing he can do for his defense because the whole reason for that set up in the casino was to provide a motive you know, for uh, Compton Crips to do the hit on Tupac when, in fact, Suge Knight's people that he hired was going to do the hit. See, it's very smart. I mean, if you study any of these uh, mafia flicks, I mean, it's just perfect. Russell referred us to ex-police officer Hackey, one of the law enforcement officers who worked for Death Row. Hackey was one of Tupac's personal bodyguards. He now operates from here in San Pedro. Ex-officer Hackey works from here as a bounty hunter. He had himself just been released from prison. Hello. John, how you doing? Hackey was Morning. incarcerated for having a trunk full of AK-47s. So, um, so when did you actually get out? Uh, actually, to be exact, I was released on the 14th of January. 14th of January? Yeah. This is Hackey as a police officer in plumper Dunkin' Donut days. He was a Compton police officer for about 14 years. 
I asked him if being a police officer and working for a criminal organization wasn't a bit of a contradiction. I, I think primarily uh, Death Row Records, uh, in a sense, hired individual officers, I mean, who were, in a sense, officers who would, you know, as I say, we see but we don't see. But isn't that a compromise? In a sense, I mean, most departments have off-duty work policy. Um, so it's all right to see drugs when you're off-duty and it's I've, not all right I, when you're on-duty? I, I can honestly say as... I would say that that was compromised. A, as man as my witness isn't upstairs. That, isn't that the word compromise? Based on the statement you said, yes, but I have never seen any but drugs. You, but you were aware, you said? There was, I had heard. But I have never seen anything with my own eyes. Well, and we're going backwards because you were aware about 30 seconds ago. I, I, I was aware of certain things, but I, I've never seen any drugs. Right. No. Hackey witnessed heated money disputes between Tupac and Suge Knight. At the time of his death, Tupac was owed over $10 million by death row. Just before his murder, Tupac told Hackey and others he'd be leaving death row and taking unreleased songs worth more millions with him. Hackey regards these as the real motives for Tupac's murder. He complained, though, that my questions were too vague. So you think what? You think I should be more specific? Be, be more specific and direct with your questions. OK, do you think Suge Knight orchestrated the hit? Saved by the pager. <laughs> uh, Based upon what I've been told uh, within the industry and based upon what I knew for a fact that was going on, uh, see, Tupac was leaving a record company, okay, because Tupac didn't need Suge Knight. He'd had other, several other offers. Um, I would have to say, in a sense, that he had something to do with the orchestration of the shooting of Tupac. So tell me, do you think that the two murders, the two killings, were connected? Biggie Smalls and Tupac? My personal opinion again. Um, yes, uh, I believe they're both connected. And do you think the same person was responsible for orchestrating the two? Yes. And that person's in Death Row Records? Yes. So why do you think uh, Biggie was killed? I think, in a sense, uh, Christopher Wallace just happened to be... Yeah, he's a well-known rap artist, but I think basically he just happened to... Based on the situation of Transparent with Tupac, the flame was lit. So in order to throw the attention off Death Row Records, this man was killed. Next best thing, it was an East-West rivalry. Let's make it seem as if Bad Boy Records had something to do with the shooting of Tupac Shakur, which by no means whatsoever was the, remotely the case. This is Shug Knight at his death row offices. I wondered if he was the victim of his own gangster posturings, the diamond earrings, the Havana cigar. This is the Shug Knight custom-made electric chair. And then there was the statement Suge Knight made about him and Tupac, seen here minutes before they were shot at. Suge Knight didn't help his credibility by saying he had a bullet stuck in his head, when in fact medical evidence showed he was only scratched by a piece of flying glass. Let me ask you something. You were hit as well in that car. Mm-hmm. Are you doing OK today? I can see your injury. I got a bullet still in my head. The bullet's still in your head? Yes. The doctor told me that um, they did brain scans, all kind of stuff, and it went in and cracked my cranium, and it stayed there. They said there'd be more chances for damage to try to take it out to sew it up. I was, I was hit there. I was grazed <clears throat> some other places. I got a deep slash with a bullet grazed the back of my neck, which if, if it went another inch, it'd hit my spine and paralyze me all the way down. Suge Knight appeared to celebrate his history of violence. Rumors that he dangled vanilla rice by the ankles, charges of violent assault, attempted murder, the reports of daily beatings at his offices. 
After a semi-successful football career, Suge Knight had reinvented himself as a mob Pyro gang member, dressing in the blood colors, surrounding himself with a posse of ex-con Pyro gang members. The mob Pyroos come from Compton in LA, also the home of their rival gang, the Crips. Suge Knight was born and grew up in this area, the area of the mob Pyroos. It was in this street that he played as a kid. He said he used to see bodies in the alley on his way home, and one has to ask how growing up in Compton affected Suge Knight. See you later. This is Reggie Wright Sr., chief gangs officer. He said the gang warfare in Compton was so intense, he'd witnessed the genocide of almost an entire generation. My mother's bedridden. I had to come in here and say hi to my sister now, keep up with her. Reggie was the most cheerful gang officer we'd ever met. So you said the mob started here, it was... Well, actually, this house right here to my right is one of the leaders of it. used to live. These kids, these are the good guys on the street. They don't get in any trouble, right, guys? Turn your butt right. I'll act like you don't want to be seen. Any other time, you right out here, right out in the front. Let them see what the good guys look like from the neighborhood. I know. What's going on, man? All right. Daddy, look. <laughs> These are some of the kids that live over here. But quite frankly, the guy in the yellow, <coughs> his dad, is one of the original Ma Pyrus. And matter of fact, his dad was present that night at the casino when they had that you incident. You mean Tupac? Because uh, he worked with uh, Shug, uh when the McDonald's, so. Tupac's murder caused massive gang warfare in Compton between the Pyrus and the Crips. The death row explanation of events was that Biggie and Bad Boy were aligned with the Crips, whereas Suge Knight, Tupac, and Death Row were with the Pyrus. Gang loyalty is the most important thing in Compton. To be called a snitch is to be as good as dead. Suge Knight lived over in this area here, over on this side of town. He never really claimed any particular gang or something because he was into football at the time and growing up, but the guys he grew up with and the gangster type guys are, are guys from this mob area over here. And uh, naturally, when he got into his business and started the Death Row label, a lot of those guys wanted jobs from him and wanted to identify with him. And he hired them to work along with him. Uh, Tupac, when he became part of Death Row, a lot of the guys that were doing uh, work with Death Row are, are more or less part of the Death Row entourage came from this area here. So. Naturally, when Tupac was killed, these guys, you know, took offense to that. And that's when we had the retaliation. After Tupac's murder, there were over 20 shootings in Compton over a 10-day period between the Pyrus associated with Death Row and the Crips. There's no evidence that the Crips were working with Biggie and Bad Boy at the time of Tupac's murder. The so-called gang war is regarded by Hackey and ex-detective Poole as being used to take attention away from Suge Knight's involvement in Tupac and Biggie's murder. This is Tupac at the Milan fashion shows. We're going to see Frank Alexander back left who was with Tupac when he was murdered. Frank Alexander appeared to be the fall guy. Despite the incident with the Crip at the MGM, Frank was the only bodyguard assigned to Tupac that night. He was unarmed and did not have a radio. When he refused to lie about the incident, Frank received death threats. Frank now lives on this horse ranch in Orange County. Oh. Good. Hi, how do you do? Good, good. Um, good to see you. What's Nick, Nick, Nick Broomfield. Oh, hi, Nick. <laughs> hi. So you, this is the UK so you were, crew, huh? Yeah. So you were <laughs> Tupac's bodyguard? Yeah. 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 Frank, a former Mr. Universe, terrified by the death threats, found spiritual peace when he became a born-again Christian. <laughs> he also got several Rottweilers to back him up in case all else failed. Frank put on his favorite cowboy suit. 
Frank spent the year following Tupac's death severely depressed. He smoked a lot of dope and contemplated suicide. Frank wrote a book about his experiences as Tupac's bodyguard called Got Your Back. So, and what, what do you think? I mean, you, you mentioned in your book that there were, you know, rumors that it was an inside job. Um, I never mentioned in my book that there was rumors of an inside job because uh, I had been on vacation prior to uh, going back uh, that day to Las Vegas to work. And I think, I think the exact phrase you used in your book was that there were rumors that Suge Knight had orchestrated the killing. I didn't even say that. Oh, in my book. Okay, so this is an exact quote from your book. Okay. Okay. It says, word circulated that the shooting was orchestrated by Shook. Word circulated. I think it did not circulate from me saying anything. No, no, no. Like I that. said that that was the quote from the book. Okay. Word um, circulated. That it has circulated that Shook has something to do with it. That the shooting was orchestrated. The killing was orchestrated by Shug. By Shug. Uh-huh. You're gonna let the dogs on me? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, because I think in the book you also said that you 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 were frightened that Shug wanted to kill you. Um, it wasn't that Shug himself or had anyone say that he wanted to kill me. I was getting death threats. I got death threats uh, indirectly through employees that were still at right way, people that I knew that were friends of mine. Well, are the policemen? No. Um, I never heard it from a police um, officer saying that um, you know I was going to be killed or anything like that. But I was told by um, LAPD and also by Las Vegas uh, Metro to watch my back and to be careful. You know, because possibly something could happen to me. I just wondered why you wrote that you were frightened of Suge and that Suge wanted to kill you. I, I didn't say that Suge wanted to kill me. Well, I, a, could, a I could give you another quote. Oh, I'm, I'm going I'm to help you on that. A friend of mine called me and said, Suge wants you dead. I go, what? He goes, DR. I go, DR? He goes, yes, Death Row Records wants you dead, which I have uh, on tape. I have it recorded. Frank and Tupac were close. Frank also gave us this video he'd shot of Tupac with his niece, Lamaika. Tupac called Frank, Frankie. Tell Frankie to call me. Frankie, you call me when she tells you to call me Frankie. Frankie goes to Hollywood. Hey, yo, Frankie. Frankie. Yo, Frankie. Why do you record this for me? The horrors of Tupac's murder are at best inconclusive. But there are inconsistencies that beg further questions. We know who's responsible for this. The problem we have with this case is we don't have anyone willing to come forward and testify to it. If you knew who killed Tupac, would you tell the police? Absolutely not. I mean, because you know I don't Why know. not? Because it's, it's not my job. I don't get paid to solve homicides. I don't get paid to tell people. Other than the fictitious bullet in the head, Further questions need to be asked about events the night of Tupac's murder. Why, for example, was Frank Alexander asked by death row to say that Orlando Anderson the Crip had snatched a chain from Tupac the night before the fight, when in fact that wasn't true? I was just asked um, concerning Orlando Anderson to say that uh, we, Tupac and I, had seen him earlier uh, at the MGM when we were over there and uh, Tupac was gambling. Um, to say that he had snatched off a, a chain off of Tupac's neck. I was told to say that. I was told to say that the night before Tupac died, and which was the 12th. And in fact, that was inaccurate. It was dead, yeah, it was inaccurate. Valletta, Biggie's mum, said he was really upset by Tupac's death. I was more shocked than anything, you know what I'm saying? But I wasn't more shocked of him dying. I was more shocked of him Pac is a strong dude, yo. I know Duke, you know what I'm saying? Right. He real strong. So when it was right. like he got shot, I was just more like, again? 
You know what I'm saying? He always getting shot or shot at. He gonna pull through this one again, make a few records about it, and it's gonna be over. You know what I'm saying? But when he when he died, I was just like, whoa. You know what I'm saying? Kind of took me by. I you mean, know, even though we was going through our drama, I would never wish death on nobody. You know what I'm saying? Cause there ain't no coming back from that. So it kind of turned me down a little bit. But at the same time, you know, you gotta move on. You know, I felt for his moms, for his family or whatever. But you know, things gotta move on. You know. Biggie was murdered a week after doing that interview. So what then happened? Once Tupac was murdered, why was Biggie next? Hacky said it was to take attention off death row. Was it aimed against Puffy to take away his most valuable asset? Or was it just that the killing machine was in place and the killing couldn't stop? We went back to Orange County to see ex-detective Russell Poole. He did a lot of the groundwork on the Biggie murder. So, and tell me, was uh, Kevin Hackey one of your main sources of information? Yes, he is. He, he was a main source of information, and his uh, information was worthy of follow-up. And, and, uh, and when I tried to follow up on that information, I was stopped and ordered not to uh, go any further. This toilet bowl sketch was placed on Russell's desk when he insisted on investigating fellow LAPD officers. The piece of excrement marks his place as D1 detective. Russell was then removed from the case. It affected him very deeply. I almost took my life, uh, uh, but it was my kids that uh, actually saved me, OK? And uh, it hurt. I was betrayed by my own department because of the core values that the Los Angeles Police Department preached from day one, honesty, integrity, okay, tell the truth, swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth so help you God, do a good job, do a thorough investigation, work for the community. Uh, I believed in the oath of office, I, I believed in the protect and serving the people. I really did. But on the inside, behind closed doors, that it wasn't the case. When it came to cops being investigated, it, it, we weren't serving the public the way we should have served the public. Biggie was murdered on March the 9th, 97, six months after Tupac. He was leaving the Vibe party at the Peterson Motor Museum in Los Angeles. It was a well-orchestrated hit. You gotta ask yourself one question. Why haven't uh, these cases been solved? And one reason that, you, that they were well-orchestrated, well-planned out, radios being used, communication, and it had to be experienced people doing this, which would lead you to believe that experienced police officers knew exactly what to do. Russell suspected police officer David Mack for orchestrating and organizing the hit using scanners and radios that were later found in his house. Officer Rafael Perez, Officer Mack's former partner and best friend, who was convicted for the sale of drugs, racketeering and falsifying evidence. Officer Kevin Gaines, who was having an affair with Suge Knight's wife, Sharita, who was later killed by a fellow LAPD officer in a road rage incident. Russell also suspected Harry Billups, a.k.a. Amma Mohammed, as a possible hitman. He's godfather to Officer Mack's kids. Officer Mack was later convicted for this bank robbery. You had a witness in Biggie's entourage who identified David Mack as being at the Peterson Museum. Uh, the car used in the case was a black SS Chevy Impala, and, uh, and David Mack owned one of those. The fact that David Mack took family illness days off prior, just prior to the Biggie Smalls case, which indicates there, was, there had to be some, what if some planning, and he couldn't be uh, uh, bothered with going to work. Uh, Officers Mac Perez and Gaines were part of a bigger police scandal, the Rampart scandal, linking officers throughout the LAPD to various forms of corruption. To find out more, we went to interview Sonia Flores at her lawyer's office. She was Officer Rafael Perez's girlfriend, as well as the girlfriend of Officer David Mack. 
I wondered if they represent the new breed of police officer whose values Hackey talked about. What well, cop doesn't want to be in the limelight? You know, everything is about, you know, authority, power, being in control. So, I mean, every, everybody wants to be around money. Everybody wants to be around, you know, women. That's just, that's the nature of the badge. Hackey also identified officers Mack and Perez as being present at private death row parties. You weren't driving a, a Jaguar or anything, This right? is Marshal no. Bitkower, Sonia's lawyer. Mack and Perez were alleged to have had lots of money. I asked Sonia if she knew about their investments. No, no investments that I knew of. You just had a good time with him. Hmm? I just had a great time with him. Did he ever ask you to experiment in a sexual way with women? Or more than two people or three people? Yeah, we did. We did. But it what, wasn't. With other police officers? Or? Yeah, I had sex with other police officers, yeah. In front of them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just crazy, crazy sex. Talk about your orgies. <laughs> the orgies. <laughs> he wants to know. Wants. You, you ask a question. No, I'm not going to ask you. You're not going to ask about the orgies. Okay, I'll ask about the orgies. You're not going to. So tell me about uh, the sex with the other police officer. This is we would go to, you know, after going to a nightclub, getting drunk, getting high, we would go to the apartment and we would just have sex, you know. My friend with one of his partners and me with him, and then he would have sex. Do you know if anybody ever filmed any of these sex orgies you told us about? No, I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. Did you ever hear rumors that they were filmed or taped? No. Never heard of that. I mean, Did I anybody ever tell you they saw uh, tapes or videos of these sex orgies with police officers? No. A shrine to Tupac was found in Officer Mack's house by detectives. I wondered how much Sonia knew. David Mack was into drinking, into learning how to dance Spanish music. Into, Rob Banks. Yeah, <laughs> Rob Banks. <laughs> he was, he was, he was more up there, yeah. More up there? More up there. More, more ambition to money. He was more into making money. Then. Did Perez talk to you about death row? Or no, or, no. Or the rappers? No, that was the other side of, of Rafael Perez, that I wasn't involved in that. Because I didn't like rap music or that kind of people. No. Did he quite like rap? Or? Yes, he did. A lot. He never talked about Suge Knight? No. Mm. Officer Mack was born and grew up in the same area of Compton as Suge Knight. He's also a self-confessed member of the mob Pyrus. Here he is wearing the colors of the Pyrus. Officers Mack and Perez did everything together. Their loyalty was always to each other. And they shared you? No, I shared them. <laughs> Not their shit, they shared me, no. You shared them? I shared them. Mm -hmm. How did that work? Well, because girls decide who they're gonna sleep with, you know? It's not a guy who's gonna decide I'm gonna sleep with this girl. It's the girl who decides I'm gonna sleep with these guys. But there was it was a little bit of a menage a trois. Yes. 50-50. Police officers Mac and Perez used to pick up girls at lap dancing bars. It was there that they also met someone called the bookkeeper, who is now himself in jail. It had been very hard to meet the bookkeeper. We were told that he'd been moved to another jail, that he suffered from Tourette syndrome, that he was manically depressed and didn't want to see anyone, and that he feared he'd be killed if he spoke to us. This is Ron Siebold, his lawyer. This is Mark Hyland, the bookkeeper. Sorry. He's up for 37 counts of impersonating a lawyer. In, um, in February of 96, um, several LAPD officers, including um, Rafael Perez, Nito, 
uh, Durden and David Mack um, were at Fritz's in Balfour, which is a gentleman's club, a, a topless bar. And at that meeting was also um, a gentleman, um, a, a rapper, um, Suge, Suge Knight, and some of his other associates and everything. And there was, in a nutshell, there was there was a hit taken out on um, Notorious B.I.G. They were talking about planning on, on how to get the monies and the weapons together. Um, one of the individuals, I, I'm, I do not recall who, said, why don't we just get them from evidence like you normally do? And they all kind of laughed and chuckled and everything at that point. My jaw about dropped, realizing that, yeah, there's a lot of booze going around here and a lot of drugs going around, but these guys seem, they seem very serious. I mean, they, they were serious. Um, subsequently, um, I, I got immunity on this, right? Yeah, fair <clears throat> um, basically, um, I then, um, I transported, um, Mark, you have federal immunity. This is what we talked about before right. these people came in. Right. You do not have district attorney. You do not have immunity from the state. Okay? Okay. Um, but I, 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 I transported monies interstate between Los Angeles and Phoenix to arrange the hit on, on Biggie big Small. And how many times would you say that you met with, with Suge Knight? Just a few. A Just few. a few. I never, I never sat down and I never really knew who he was. I mean, I just knew that he demanded a lot of respect from people. Um, it wasn't until recently that I, I learned who really who he is and, and what he's done and it that's why like I said I wish I was making making it all up because I don't know what my life is going to be when I get out and why did you decide to come forward with this information guilt It was wrong. And I didn't want to be involved anymore. Kaki just informed us he was working as an undercover FBI agent a year before Tupac was killed. According to Hacky, FBI agents and ATN agents were in cars just behind Tupac on the night he was shot. Hacky claims he was betrayed by the FBI. He wasn't given the promotion he was promised, and they then let him languish in jail. Howdy. We'd caught Hacky on the hop. I said around 11. You yeah, guys doing okay? Yeah. Yourself? Good. I can't complain. It's been a good day so far. Hacky says he has the documents to prove his claims. No mail. No mail. So, did you manage to get those uh, documents you mentioned? Yeah, I managed to get, I told you I can get the documents. That's not an issue. My attorney's working on a thing. I'm working on something. See, once, are we on tape? No. Wait for wait. What's so amazing about these documents? Uh, put it to you this way. Oops. I've already been offered a quarter of a million dollars. Okay. A quarter of a million dollars for what? These documents. They're actually, really? Yeah. From who? Come on now. What? Oh, you got that camera on me again. Quarter of a million dollars, that's a lot of money. 
I told you, I made this for the money. I mean, excuse my friends, I got bullshit. I got fuck off money. I ain't worried about that. Fuck I told you I'm money. I'm saying I got that kind of money. You know what I'm saying? I got that kind of, I told you I'm not hurting for money. I'm not a millionaire, but I'm far from hurting for money. Remember, I told you that before. Good morning. Good morning. There's certain documentations which indicate certain people who were involved all along, certain people. In the killing of Biggie. I would say that'd be a true statement, okay? And there's certain people within the DA's office who've known about these things all along. Now, whether or not someone's actually gonna pinpoint that an actual ex-officer killed Biggie, I don't know if they'll ever be able to prove that. But as far as the person who actually did the shooting, as far as I'm concerned, I believe, I believe probably within um, 24 hours, or even two weeks max, I could have the person in custody, guaranteed who the person is. Okay, and LAPD has known this all along. And is this the guy that Russell Poole thinks is responsible, Harry Billups? Oh, uh, jeez. I, I, would, I would say yes on that. Don't ask me why or how do I know this and that. I refuse to answer that, okay? But uh, I, would, I would say it's a good guess. It's a good, I'd say 99%. This is the police composite of Biggie's hitman. And this is Russell's main suspect, Harry Billups, a.k.a. Amal Mohammed, who to this day has never been questioned by the LAPD. He's known to Shook. He's known to Reggie. He's known to... Uh, a handful of LAPD officers, which have obviously come about in the Rampart scandal, and obviously uh, uh, the other individual, which is in federal prison now for the bank robber. So, I mean, in a sense... Who's David uh, Mack? Yeah. So Perez's uh, partner. Oh, you want me to clarify? Okay, well, yeah. Uh, you know, in a sense, there's just too many, I guess, in a sense, in a whole scenario, whether it be Tupac's killing or uh, Christopher's killing, I mean, there's just... There's too many dots that are connecting. But isn't that a bit vague? I mean, connecting dots, you can't really make an arrest on that. You, exactly, you it's can't really make an arrest. It's just an allegation. It's just an allegation, but again, but LAPD maybe, is sitting on a major piece of the puzzle. And why haven't they done anything about it? You, you know what, I, I don't know. Why, why was Russell Poole taken off the case when he originally brought, hey, Chief, you know, there's corruption, stuff's been going long gone in the department. Let's move Russell somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? Why are a lot of things done? This is the video of Little C's, who was with Biggie when he was shot and who provided the police composite. After many failed attempts to get little C's, Valletta, Biggie's mum, took over. This is Miss Wallace. This is Miss Wallace. I'm fine, thank you. Did C's leave us yet? Yeah. Don't you dare park on the other side. Park over here. And finally, here was Little C's, the main witness to the murder. Okay. How are you? Uh, how you doing, you all right? I'm all right. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> all right? Hey, how you doing, all right? How you doing? Biggie's ashes are kept here in this urn, in his old house where Valletta now lives. See what he does the first thing he came with? What's that? What's... Huh? I had to go just, you know, speak to my boy real fast. How you doing, yo? I'm What's doing that? okay. You all right? That's the urn. So every time he comes in, he gotta go over there and, yeah, and touch it. Big. Yeah. So this was, that's Christopher's little heart of everybody that, you know, he was associated and affiliated with. This was, he meant a lot to my son and that, those were my son's words. I asked Little C's where he was sitting in the car with Biggie. Yeah, I was right behind him. He was in the passenger, he was in the passenger seat and I was right behind him. In the back seat, I was the right there. Seat. Yeah. 
And what did you see? I just seen I just seen the car just roll up and just start shooting in there. With one dude in the car by itself. You know what I'm saying? I was sitting outside the window, you know, I was looking out the window and the car just rolled up, stopped right there on the angle of us and start shooting in the car. He only shot through a big door, you know. No, this was something that whoever did it, they had to see all that and they had to plan it, you know, because it happened it happened too good. And it was it was a it was police out there. They they shut the party down from a fire drill, so it was police there. These are FBI photos. The amazing thing is that Biggie and Puffy were under surveillance at the time of the murder. So did you see the FBI? Yeah. I saw them and and, and after after Biggie, after the Biggie death, you know, I had spoke to a couple of police and I saw a couple of pictures that they had when they was watching us. They were showing me pictures of me, asking me who I'm, who is that? And I'm telling them that's me. You know, they asked me who is that? That's Biggie's best friend D Rock. That's oh, it. So they were showing you. So they were showing us pictures when they was followers and this and that. And they showed us, they they showed they were showing old pictures that you know that was in this house that the police had in L.A. So, you know, I was thinking, like, God damn, you know, something real fishy is going on. I called the FBI agent who took the photos. Hello? Oh, hello. Is that Detective? It would be, yes. Um... I was wondering if I could talk to you because um, I understand that you were following uh, Biggie Smalls and Puffy Coombs at the time that um, Biggie's... Uh, Who are you? My name's uh, Nick Broomfield. Yeah. And um, I, I was just... Uh, I saw some photographs that I believe you might have taken and I was wondering if I could Nick, talk... what do you do for a living? I'm uh, a uh, documentary filmmaker. Okay. Uh, let me call you back. I'm in court right now. Call you a little later. I discovered he was attending Puffy's trial for the nightclub shooting. Will be on. No, I was just wondering what, you know, what it was that you were investigating at the time. Right. Um, well, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't discuss it with you. Oh, you wouldn't discuss it? No. E even though it was some time ago? Well, it hasn't finished yet. It hasn't finished? Where'd you get my number? Where'd you get my number? Sorry? Where'd you get my number? Where did I get your number? In 1993, a Senate Select Committee was set up to look into the hip-hop movement. Fear of its inflammatory qualities led to FBI surveillance. And your number was one of the numbers I was given. As somebody, you know, who was very, who was actually following uh, Biggie at the time that he was, who was, he was shot and who might be able to give me some information. You know, I just, sorry? Who gave you my number? I really, I really don't know offhand who that was. Okay, well, when you figure it out, beat me. I'll call you back and we'll talk. Okay. We went back to tell Valletta about the conversation. My son was just a little upcoming rapper in California. Um, for a, 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 an award. FBI was following him. Were they following him here in New York City, up there in California, everywhere he was going? Why? I would like to know why. Miss Wallace would like to know why. If FBI was following my son, where were they that night my son was shot? And why is it, if they weren't there, why is it that moment, that night, they were taken off? Those are questions that needed to be looked into. Those are investigations that need to be looked into. Biggie was unaware of what was going on. This was Biggie a couple of days before he was shot. How did it get to that day where you got to watch your back and have bodyguards? I mean, it's not just with rappers, you know what I'm saying? People are going to attack anybody. That's a large figure, you know what I'm saying? They did it to Jordan, they did it to Tyson, incredible. they did it to Bill Cosby, you know what I'm yep, saying? Right. They're gonna attack you if you're on top, you know what I'm saying? It's just your job to bob and weave, you know what I'm saying?
We applied to Suge Knight's prison to get permission to film. In the meantime, Valletta put us in touch with Biggie's bodyguard. Valletta said he had a strange encounter when he was standing with Puffy just before Biggie got shot. Gene, the bodyguard, lives here in Upper Manhattan. I heard he was at least six foot seven. You was knocking like you were scared, man. <laughs> scared? Yeah. No, I'm not there. All right. How do you do, are you? I'm good. Yeah. Gene's apartment had a great view. I asked him why his blinds were normally down and not open. Black people don't do that. They go on the club. I don't want you to see. <laughs> I want to be running out the door with your television. <laughs> Yo, they got a TV and it's color. <laughs> they don't the, want that type of shit. The blinds is a white person's thing. No, I didn't say that. Oh. I say having your windows wide open so everybody can see you, it's a white person thing. Oh. See, look, you can tell white people live over there. <laughs> all the windows see, all the windows are open. <laughs> Look at the building. White people coming out that building, man. Rolling it? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, I would pay that in mind. Huh? I asked Gene why mind. Biggie's friends hadn't been more cooperative with the police. I wouldn't be talking to you if it wasn't for Miss Wallace. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If she wasn't pouring on her hard crime, I wouldn't be saying jack shit to you. Mm. You understand? I think, yeah, some of the other people in the whole crew should have came forward. Yeah, I believe that. You understand? Because I believe Big is uh, turning over in his grave because people ain't coming to the forefront for his mother. He, they knew he loved his mother, he cared for his mother, whatever like that. You understand what I'm saying? Everybody do. Everybody care for their mom. You understand? And I just believe that maybe some people should have came forward and then maybe people just want to just say, listen, I'm going to leave this shit alone. You know, that's their own choice. I'm going to eat, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Bad boy, biggie, whoever, whatever. If I got to shovel shit for a living, I'm going to eat. I showed Gene the police I composites of the hitman. So do you, uh, do you recognize any of these pictures here? That's like... This is the individual that... That one. This one right here. That one. Yeah. That's the one Lucy's did for the police. That's him right there. That's him? Yeah. That's him. That's the guy that came up to me. That guy. Wait to it again. That, that guy, guy right there. That's him? Yeah. Were you ever shown his picture before? That's definitely him, though. Mm. Yep. Well, that's Harry Billups, isn't it? That's who? He's called Harry Billups. Emil, or Emil Mohammed, right? That's his name. That was the guy. You can really remember a face that well, wow. You'd be surprised why. I can remember face. You can't? Yeah. Yeah. I believe you, actually. Mm -hmm. I had him to a T before um, P called me that morning. He said, a guy in the nation of Islam shot big. And I said, yo, dog, he had the blue suit, blue bow tie, white shirt, peanut head, receding hairline, brown skin. He was like, yeah, dog, how you know? I said, a nigga came up to me first. I said, he came to us first. He walked up the Puff van. And I got him off. And he was like, get the fuck out of here. I was like, yeah, straight up, for real. He came up there first. It's amazing the police never showed you that still picture before. Can't recall him? Nope. They never showed it to you before. They showed me a lot of other shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But they they absolutely never showed you that picture. I can't recall them showing me that picture. Hi, Rob.
Russell. We went to play Gene's oh. interview to Russell. Hi. We've got this big tape recorder. Who have we got on today? Stevie Nicks. Ah. Oh, and I'm pleased we got you in your shorts, finally. <laughs> Good. Mm -hmm. This guy had a stronger street, uh, cheekbone structure, whereas that he looked a little sterner look. Right there. He still works that's for the him. probation. That's yeah. him looking at the, the lineup. That's, okay. that's right, the so. guy that came up to me. That guy. Right there. That guy. Okay, so we got a witness saying David the Mack the was there, and now we got a witness saying Harry Billups that's was there. Him, Amir Muhammad, aka Amir Muhammad. Yep. It's amazing. Best of it. What, what do you make of that? I think it's uh, it's a breakthrough in the case. I think uh, this is another example of how incomplete the investigation is and how they have uh, tried everything or done everything to avoid the truth in the matter. And uh, I still, in my heart, believe that these types of clues and these types of statements made by witnesses need to be thoroughly followed up on. And uh, I honestly believe that uh, the players that we're talking about, uh, David Mack and Amir Muhammad, are somehow involved in this case. And the department, uh, time and time again, has avoided the truth. Mm -hmm. And when you add everything up, what other uh, reason could there be? The reason being is because they do not want to expose to the public that Los Angeles police officers were involved in the conspiracy to kill Biggie Smalls. The most amazing thing in this whole story is that Officer David Mack and Officer Rafael Perez have never been questioned in connection with the Biggie Smalls murder. Neither has Harry Billups, AKA Amo Mohammed, who we tried to contact through his lawyer. If nothing else, their names should be cleared. The question now is with Tupac and Biggie dead, Will the killing machine carry on? There was a news report that Suge Knight had threatened Snoop Dogg, seen here together in happier days. Snoop apparently is now frightened for his life. We wondered if this document had anything to do with it. After a concert at Universal Studios, Snoop Dogg was attacked, kicked and punched by people working for death row. When asked by one of the deputies if he knew who had killed Tupac Shakur, Snoop said it was the man sitting next to Tupac. When asked if he meant Suge Knight, Snoop replied affirmatively. Suge Knight's prison has come back, giving us permission to film. But I'm having problems with Death Row, who I'm having to negotiate with to interview Suge Knight. I'm dealing with this man, Reggie Jr., seen here second left, who's been running Death Row since Suge Knight's been in prison. Reggie Jr. is the son of Reggie Sr., who we'd so much admired and interviewed in Compton. Reggie Jr. had followed in his father's footsteps and also became a police officer before running death row. I remembered what Hackey had said about Reggie Jr. They'd served as Compton police officers together. If Reggie and I ever met one-on-one, -on -one, I think we would probably be who's gonna draw first. The other unfortunate thing was that Reggie didn't seem to be a great fan of my films. Because I don't want none of this Heidi Feist bullshit tape that you did, where you go and the, the whole thing was to show how y'all were so you were so slick to get to Heidi, and, and everybody around around Heidi was bumbling fools. And if you don't say that's how your documentary went on Heidi Feist, then you're not an honest man. And well, I hope that this will be. I don't be, want that to be. I hope this will be a much better film than the Heidi Feist film. I, I I hope so as well. Oh, you thought it was really I'm bad. Point it, I did say that. My whole point is, don't use us to get that type no. of work done. No, if I mean... You just be straight with us, okay. and we'll tell you what we can and can't do. Well, a well, lot of things we don't mind speaking. We don't like speaking on the Tupac thing, because that's an unfortunate thing that happened. We know Unfortunately, that Reggie was insisting that a death row representative attend the interview. Power. I mean, I would gladly take him in there, and I, you know... It's just, uh, well, that's well, not my decision. Okay, well, see what you can do to help him get approved. And if you can't, then um, you can go. But I can assure you, Mr. Knight, or any any guys that is, that's, uh, I can probably even say any guys that's black in the prison won't be speaking 
won't be speaking to you. Why is it that? Really? I guarantee you that. Unhappily, we never did reach agreement with Reggie. But as we still had the prison's permission to film, we decided to go anyway, even though Suge Knight had refused. The camera person dropped out for self-preservation, but the rest of us had overseas passports, so we went anyway. This is Mule Creek State Prison, a maximum security facility in Northern California where Suge Knight has served the majority of his sentence. This is Suge Knight's recreation yard, Yard C. Should we try and find Mr. Suge Knight? Well, we can go out and try to find just about anybody that you want to talk to out here. Oh, yeah. The immediate problem we had was in actually finding Suge Knight, as we hadn't arranged an interview. It's a nice day. I did. Suge's not a worker. He should be out here somewhere. So. Okay. Come to the side, Mark. We could do this. The cameraman, who I'd never worked with before, had the app dabs. Okay. We talked to them and find out. Well, more of that side. We can go up to those guys with the guitars if you want and talk to them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I did. Go ahead and have them not film while we walk up to these guys. Like, like several ones, like this. Reggie had said no one would talk to us, but we just had to try. What's your name? My name is Jimmy. Hi, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. And, uh, you know, the music is, 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 is so much a part of me that I have to have some kind of music in my life. Do you, you know, uh, we're looking for Suge Knight, too. Is he, he, he does music. Yeah, he does music. I, I, he's not around right now. I don't, I don't see him around. Right don't see him around. The Indian Sweat Lodge was playing, but there was no sign of Suge Knight. So he's not somewhere out there, though. I don't see him here. Should we just keep walking around the track? The warden suggested we try Suge Knight's cell block, cell block 15. 15 control staff, please. You need to get in. Oh, It was extraordinary to suddenly be in Suge Knight's cell block. Wow. We all looked around in amazement. To this table right here. Well, they got a with them, so. Yeah. And then we saw him at the far end on the phone. Maybe I'll go and ask him. He's on the other phone now. I guess. I'll ask him. Shall I? No, I, I don't mind asking him. I don't mind asking him. I'll just put. I'll, I'll just put this down and ask him. What do you think? Wait till he gets off. I'll go ask him. All right. I guess he's hurt his leg. Yeah, that's from his foot. What? How do you do? I need to talk to you. Oh, okay, sorry. <coughs> you running? I don't know what the warden said 
but Suge Knight agreed to do a short interview. I wondered what Suge Knight would want to talk about in this, his first filmed interview at Mule Creek Prison. He's been in for five years. I heard he was on the warpath for Snoop Dogg. Hi. Oh, OK. My cameraman seemed a bit jittery. It was like he wasn't there, dreaming of some tropical island in a better world somewhere else. I noticed he seemed to be looking around for a possible route of escape. Let me talk to you one more time. OK. We're doing a benefit for some kids out there, too. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? I don't know if you talked to anybody from my office. Have you ever talked to anybody from my yeah. office? Yeah, spoke to Reggie. Right. You yeah. talked to Reggie. I mean, I don't have to do this. No, I know you don't. If I do this, because, you know, we're doing a piece positive for the kids. OK. So so I want there's, there's no slander and funny stuff. Is it what's the, what you want to ask me before we get on that? Well, happy? I said, I, you know, I gathered that you didn't really want to talk very much about Tupac. Mm -hmm. I agreed to no slander and funny stuff and to ask Suge Knight about his message to the kids. And so what is the special message you would like to send to the kids? Like I said before, when you first came in, if it's any time it could be anything positive to help with the kids, well, if they can see from if it's my mistakes or the next person's mistakes, we don't have to make the same mistakes. I'm all open for it. What, and, what would you, and what would you like to say to them about the mistakes? About the mistakes that was, I, I, I was, you know, everybody makes mistakes. And you got in the media what's going on today for is a lot of kids saying they get they, they input off of rap music or rap artists or, or entertainment. I think um, some of that could be true, but most of it, uh, I would like them to understand that majority, not majority, basically all the artists who's involved in, if they get in trouble, these guys have record companies back them that would get them high-powered lawyers. If they have high-powered lawyers, nine out of 10, they would never ever, you know, come to the penitentiary. But the guys in the inner city, if they get in trouble, they have a, what we call a public tender, a public defender, which is, they're not going to have the best. And they, and, go to prison. and they go to prison for a long time. So they long should time. model themselves on rap stars with big lawyers. No, they should. I mean, besides that, you know, you have um, certain individuals who's artists, and they might get in trouble. They might do a few things, but they like and they well known names and they inform it for. Uh, the police, they snitches. Snoop Dogg. And if they get in trouble, they're gonna get a free pass. Like, if you hear about it, um, there's several artists that would never, ever come to prison. No matter what they do, you hear about it getting caught, if it's firearms, getting caught with drugs, doing this, doing that. Like who, do you think? Well, put it to you like this. When you look at it, and you think about it, and you see that you watch the news, you follow the people's trials, people's court cases, or you follow the, what you hear, word of mouth, what you hear about the streets, about the guy getting 25 years because he had a um, two dollar piece of crack cocaine on him, or a guy got 10 years because he had a firearm on him. Then you get a guy for us, if it's a, um, it's not personal, so I don't want to make it seem like okay. I'm slandering these guys' names, or, or if you hear about a lot of the artists Used to be, some of them used to be on death row, some on other labels. You might hear them um, getting caught with drugs, getting caught with a gun, stab somebody, do those type of crimes. They're not going to come to prison. One of the reasons they're not going to come like to prison. Snoop, or? Well, Snoop would never come. I mean, Snoop was on, you know, we'd be the murder trial for him, but then he was on probation. Then he got caught with two ounces of marijuana. Then he got caught with guns. And each time, it's nothing. They're not going to violate him because for the street guys, the street guys know what I'm talking about. There's no puzzle. I mean, if you get a guy that constantly getting in trouble and never gonna come to prison, that's because he's an informant, he's a rat, yeah. a snitch, yeah. you know? And they're more important to the police on the streets than in here because 
they let them know what's going on. They might save their soul by telling them three or four or five other guys. You know, I'm from Compton, and I'm, a rat is the lowest you can go. A rat will do anything. But you don't think yeah. Snoop was a rat? I mean, I don't want to make Alice, I don't want to, I don't need to put nobody out there. Okay. If, if I do that, it's like a form of talent. But for the street guys out there, they know. They know this guy never come to prison. They know the only way to keep out, stay out of prison is one way. And you look at it, I got nine years. It's just that he watched the tape 25 times. He couldn't tell if I kicked or just broke it up. The victim said I didn't know, but I still got nine years. I know I was gonna have to pay a debt to society before it's coming to prison because if you come from the inner city, you come from the ghetto, and you act up off that block, you'll come to prison sooner or later. If you don't come to prison, there's only a few things, you know, you gotta be working with the police. Suge Knight is leaving prison in one month's time. He denies any involvement in the murders. Snoop Dogg is terrified, though. He has trebled his security right. guards. Kevin Hackey has applied for a special concealed weapons license, citing Suge Knight as the reason. And we were literally chased out of town by calls from Death Row and Afeni, Tupac's mom's lawyers, objecting to interviews we had done. Suge Knight and Afeni now work together and plan to release some of Tupac's unpublished material. Just by chance, we logged onto the Death Row website, expecting to find a message to the kids. Instead, it was for Snoop Dogg from Suge Knight. Give me a hug, you know. It's nice, nice to see We introduced Valletta and Russell, who'd never met before. Because I came out into the press after I retired. Russell is helping Valletta with a massive lawsuit she's bringing against the LAPD for her son's wrongful death. It's expected to be one of the biggest lawsuits against the police department of recent memory. Valletta thinks the tragedy of Big E and Tupac's friendship was that it was destroyed by outside forces. Can you sign on? She's determined to find her son's killer. Valletta is someone we all particularly admired and cared for. She's shown such amazing courage in this whole story. <laughs> it smells fantastic. Oh, I'm making you some delicious Valletta's appetizer. <laughs> oh, I did this. Um, this, this was it in the newspaper. Smells so incredible. This was in one of the, the hip hop magazines. Was it? Yeah, but instead of chicken soup, I hope you guys like red meat. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is um, beef. It's like a T bone steak. I cut into little shreds and make my homemade mm. soup. My son usually loves love the soup. Valletta and Christopher had a great relationship. There is not a, <laughs> there is not a day. I spoke to him on the phone, and I didn't laugh. I remember once, I don't know where he was, what part of the world he was, but I knew it was maybe about one o'clock in the daytime, and I was mad at him. And um, I think I yelled at him. And he said, you owe me an apology. I said, I don't know, I'm not gonna apologize to you. And my mom was, I said, mom, speak to your grandson. Mom was talking, said, if you do not apologize to me and tell me you love me, I'm not gonna hang up this phone. <laughs> sure. And I hang up my phone. And I swear, maybe about an hour or two after, I picked up my phone, nothing. Hello? Hello. What are you doing on my phone? I said. I, said, I told you I wasn't gonna hang up this phone. I said, were you on this phone? For yes, I was. And I looked. Said, no, this this jackass was not on this phone. All this. I said, no. I need to make a telephone. Oh, not until you say you're sorry and say you love me. You know what you have to say. Okay, Christopher, I love you. Isn't that easy? You let me sit here. Fall asleep, wake up, and you all you had to do was to tell me you love me, and this would not have happened. <laughs> okay, Christopher, get off the phone. That's when he got off the phone. <laughs> From like 12.30 to about 3.30, he was on my phone. I could not, be, I could not believe it. I said, I told you, 
I told you I was not going to get off this phone until you do. See, that's the relationship we have. That's the beautiful relationship we have.